Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on AQA electrode potentials and electrochemical cells. So this video is dedicated to AQA. So if you are studying uh, AQA A-level chemistry, then this is the video for you. It's not like, say, some other resources where they may be um, quite generic and they'll, which is nothing wrong in that, of course, nothing wrong in generic information, but you might find that you look at it and think, is this on my specification? Do I need to know this? Well, this video solves that and actually goes through um, everything that you need to know for the AQA specification. And in fact, there is a full range of um, videos, revision videos like this um, for year one and year two. Um, just have a look on my Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Um, there's a full range there. There is also um, some uh, past paper uh, walkthrough questions and there's some whiteboard tutorials where you can use them to look at specific areas of chemistry um, which are a little bit more generalized so um, but there's a full range of things on there and they're all for free there's no charge for them whatsoever very comprehensive all I ask is that you just hit the subscribe button that would be absolutely fantastic um, just to show you support um, as long as I as long as people keep subscribing and keep watching then I'll just keep on making them it's as simple as that really um, so um, also these um, slides are available to purchase um, on, my, on my test shop. So if you click on the link in the description box below, you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Um, they're great value for money. Um, you can use them on your um, tablet or your smartphone when you're on the move. Um, you can also, and I know some people who have uh, printed them off and used them as revision notes, um, printed off each of the individual slides um, and collated them all together. So all the topics are here and they are dedicated to AQA. So um, uh, go and have a look there, click on the link in the description box and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. So like I say, this is dedicated to AQA and obviously it meets the, um, it meets the specification points that you can see um, printed uh, printed on the on the top there so we're mainly going to look at things like electrode potential electrode potentials and cells so we're going to look at half cells at EMF etc um, and then um, towards the end we're then going to look at um, commercial applications um, so batteries and then electric and of electric electrochemical cells um, and we're going to look at fuel cells as well towards towards the the end of the video so this has a lot of electricity so if you're physics minded then you're going to absolutely love this put it that way so i like physics as well so um so yes yeah, so we're gonna uh, um, we're gonna start by looking at uh, obviously the cell side first okay so let's look at half cells so a half cell is one half of an electrochemical cell and they can be constructed of a metal dipped into, into its ions or a platinum electrode with two aqueous ions in. Okay. Now you might have done these if you go to school or college, you might have seen these if you do them independently. I'm not sure if you have or not, uh, but certainly if you've um, if you go to school or college, these types of practicals are pretty pretty good practicals. Um, so, for example, you have um, a half cell is basically just very simply just a bit of metal stuck in a solution of its ions dead simple dead straightforward so for example here we see we've got an iron electrode uh, and the iron electrode is dipped into the um, iron 2 or iron 3 solution uh, below and actually when we um, when the metal comes into contact with its ions there is a reaction that occurs believe it or not uh, and the reaction is in equilibrium and we have an Fe2 plus for example here if we have Fe2 plus ions so we have Fe2 plus um, plus two electrons and will actually be in equilibrium with the ion. So there is actually a reaction that's happening here um, at the at the end of this um, uh, electrode. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's something you might not have known. So um, you can see here, sometimes we have um, a situation where we might have two metal ions. So it's all right if we've got a metal and an ion, but some ions don't have a solid version. So there is a solution to that. Uh, literally, um, there's a solution to that where we use um, a platinum electrode um, like this and we have a solution of, um, for example, different ions. So we might have the reaction between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, so the equilibrium reaction of them two. Um, now, obviously, there is no metal version of this because all ions are um, dissolved in, in solutions, so they're aqueous. So, um, so there's no metal version so we still need an electrode so we need an electrode such as platinum platinum is very expensive but um it's a, um it's got a good um electrical conductivity so that's that's pretty good we're going to make a cell uh, and also it's inert the last thing we want is our electrode to be starting to um interfere with the reaction in our solution because we we just want it just to conduct electricity that's all we want it to do so thankfully 
platinum is perfect for that job. Um, and so an electrochemical cell um, is created by joining these two different half cells together and we get a full cell. Okay, so let's have a look at what these, um, what these cells are and what they look like. So it's made up of basically um, two half cells joined together with a wire, a voltmeter, uh, and we've got a salt bridge as well between the two. So we're going to look at the um, what an um, electrochemical cell looks like. So here's the picture here. And you can see we've just taken two half cells. Here we've used a zinc and a copper one. Okay, um, And one side is actually undergoing a reduction process, whereas the other side is actually undergoing an oxidation process. So essentially, we have a redox reaction. Um, it's not like the shower gel. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's reduction and oxidation, of course it is. Um, so, um, yes, so essentially we have a redox reaction happening here. So um, let's have a look and um, label this diagram. So we see we've got a voltmeter here, um, and this is used to measure the voltage. Um, I know physicists may be screaming at me, it's not the voltage, um, it's actually the potential difference, I know. Um, so it's the potential difference then, potential difference is measured in volts, and it's between two half cells, uh, and this is called the EMF or the E cell, okay? And electrons, these flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive one. Okay, that's very, very important. So they flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive one, as long as you know the direction in which these electrons are traveling. And we're going to look at that as well, because um, a lot of cells, a lot of these um, electrochemical cells is, pr is predominantly um, to do with obviously metals in their solutions. Of course it is but also it's to do with uh, mainly to do with trapping the electrons. So utilizing the electrons that would normally transfer. So between these two beakers, if we were to mix these in two beakers, there would be a reaction. But what we're doing is we're kind of tricking it. We're saying, right, yeah, you are reacting, but what we want to do is take the electrons um, at the same time and actually make some use out of it. So to, for example, um, power electronics that I'm using now to record this. So um, the zinc half cell, shows the loss of electrons as zinc loses electrons easier than copper and we're going to look at um, a little bit more of this on the on the next slide looking at um you know how do we know one's more more likely to give up electrons than the other we're going to look at that later on basically it's the reduction oxidation so effectively the zinc um the zinc um reaction is zinc forming zinc two plus um, plus two electrons as you can see here so what we'd see our observation is actually our zinc electrode here would get thinner this is because our zinc is converting into its ions which are in solution as you can see there um, and obviously it'll form two electrons as well okay so we're producing more zinc two plus ions in solution at the bottom there so let's have a look so electrons go round and they go around to the uh, copper electrode. Okay, so that's basically what's happening in the zinc side. So what do you think might happen with copper then? So let's have a look. So our copper actually accepts them electrons that were produced by zinc on the other side, uh, and reduction happens here. So effectively the copper two plus ions in that solution there, they react with um, the electrons that came from the zinc, and they form copper metal, so CUS. Um, and what we would see, our observation, is that electrode would actually get thicker um, because the copper two plus ions would accept the electrons to form uh, the copper, um, the copper that actually coats the bottom of that electrode. So you can see here, there's two bits to it. There's always a reduction side and an oxidation side. Um, and um, depending on what we connect it with, will depend on what type of reactions we're going to get. But the principle is similar. Um, the similarities are that they all produce, there's all the transfer of electrons. And what we do is we use them electrons to do something with it. That's all we're doing. That's essentially how a battery or a cell works. Okay, we'll look at batteries later on, but batteries contain these cells. Okay, so we have this salt bridge as well. Obviously, our salt bridge um, is uh, contains potassium nitrate. A salt bridge is a funny thing because really you just use practically you just use some filter paper. You um, convert the uh, roll the like a round filter paper. You roll that into a um, a strip. You dip that into saturated potassium nitrate solution, very very saturated solution, um, and then you drape it between the two beakers as you can see on there. So they're draped between there and there. And really, um, the role of the salt bridge is just to complete the circuit. You don't really need to know much about the salt bridge, um, but um, it just allows the ions to flow through 
um, which balance out the charges in the two beakers. So you don't need to know much about that other than the fact that the salt bridge must be dipped into the solution of each beaker um, and the salt bridge must not come into contact with the metals uh, the, the metals here. So you just drape that across um, and just uh, that allows the ions to flow through and balance out the charges. Okay, so we're going to look at um, electrode potential. So remember what we said was a more about the more reactive and least reactive metal. So what we're going to look at here is um, what we mean or how we can we identify if something's been reduced and something's been oxidized. Well, actually, what we what we can do is we can use something called electrode potentials, which are E naught values. And what these do is these measure the electrode potential of each um, half cell in volts. Um, and it shows us the um, how easily the half cell gives up electrons, which is oxidized. Okay, so just remember that. So you see from that previous slide, we had the um, the two half cells, which were zinc and copper half cells. And you will have noticed um, that we have um, obviously the, the two half equations here, as you can see there. There's our two half equations. So we've got zinc and copper. And you can see they're both written in the reduced form so they're both plus electrons okay so that's the first thing so we always write them in that way and you'll notice that um, in the electrochemical series and we'll look at that later as well later on in the video uh, but the electrochemical series is something that you will have a reference to so you will have a copy of this in the exam um, you may have a data book if you use it within lessons or, or lectures um, so um, but you will always have the numbers you're not expected to remember the numbers thank god because there's a lot of information there's a lot of them there and um, so basically we always show in the electrochemical series we always show them in the reduced form so um, you'll see for example that each one of them species is gaining electrons that doesn't mean that that's actually happening in the cell this is just a theoretical um, a theoretical view Okay, so remember, when we connect two half cells together, we always have one half cell undergoing reduction, and we have one half cell undergoing oxidation. Okay, so remember that. So we need to work out which one is being reduced and which one's being oxidized. And we essentially do that by looking at the electrode potential value, um, which is the E0 value, and obviously you'd find that in a data book. So the key thing is we can see that from looking at this data, and again, this is data that you'd have access to, we can see that the zinc two plus zinc half cell, so this one at the top here, um, has a negative E0 value, and the Cu two plus and Cu half cell has a positive E0 value, okay? So they've both got different values here, okay? Now you might think, well, so, so what? What does that mean? Well, I've got an acronym here. Now you might remember it in a different way. You may be taught this in a slightly different way, there's a few ways in which you can um, teach electrode potentials and, and they'll probably get to the same point, which is fine, okay? And there's no right or wrong way of getting there necessarily. Um, it's about making sure that you understand what's going on. So I'm going to introduce you to an acronym which I like to use because it helps to um, keep everything um, neat and tidy. And you'll see this acronym used actually later on in the video. I'll use it a lot. So I'm going to introduce it to you. Um, it's not very creative, but at least it'll help you to remember what's going on. So... Um, we remember the rule, no problem, okay? So it's not really an acronym, but it's kind of. So no problem. So the most negative half cell will undergo oxidation. The most positive half cell will undergo reduction, okay? So you can see there we've got um, a negative half cell will undergo oxidation. So this is the most negative. So that's going to go und undergo oxidation. And this one's the most positive. So that one's going to undergo um, reduction, okay? So... You can see most negative um, oxidation takes place. So because that's the most negative and oxidation takes place, remember oxidation is the loss of electrons. So you remember the acronym um, from year one chemistry that I use, which is oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. So because this is oxidation, we've got to show the equation losing electrons. Really simple. All we do anything that's been oxidized or the oxidation process we flip that equation back to front so that's exactly what we've done there with the zinc we've taken the zinc form zinc 2 plus plus two electrons okay so we flip that the other way around we keep the other one the same because that's still shown reduction so then 
In this cell, we have zinc giving up electrons and zinc copper 2 plus accepting them. And what we can do is combine these um, two half equations together to form a full ionic equation. And so this is the product of it here. So we've got zinc solid uh, plus copper 2 plus will form zinc 2 plus and copper solid. Okay, so um, remember that acronym, no problem. That's the if you forget anything in this video, don't forget that acronym because it's going to really help you substantially later on when you're looking at more complicated examples. Okay. Right. So these E0 values here, and um, these E0 values are obviously uh, negative and positive values, etc. Now, these E0 values will only exist if we connect it with something else. And you might think, well, how do we know that zinc has got a minus 0.76? And how do we know copper has got plus 0.34? How do we know these figures? Well, I hear you cry. So um, we have something called a she. It's called a standard hydrogen electrode. Okay. Um, and basically, the standard hydrogen electrode is used as a reference to measure standard electrode potential. So all them figures there were calculated by connecting it with a she. Um, and then that's allowed to... Um, obviously, that that's then allows us to um, measure the the E naught value. So electrode potentials of half cells they can't be measured on their own. No surprise. We can't just put a bit of metal in the solution and say oh it's generating electricity because it won't. It's just going to react with the. It's going to exist in equilibrium. So what we can do is we can measure the E naught values and reference this to a standard hydrogen electrode. So a she um, and with the E naught value which equals zero. It's very important in science to uh, to have a reference because it allows us to, um, if we have a reference, say in this case it's going to be the standard hydrogen electrode, it allows us to compare values globally. So if it was somebody in, um, say, in America or Germany or France or Japan or anybody who's doing these types of reactions, okay, um, these reactions will be... Um, uh, these reactions will be standard, they're under standard conditions, and so that allows us to compare the values, and it's a universal language, effectively. Um, so, you know, we measure everything against this value. So, this is the setup here, okay? So, we've got, here we've got a, um, a copper half cell, and we want to measure the electrode potential of this copper half cell. And we've got our platinum electrode, you see, on the left there. So, let's have a look at the setup. So what goes in here is hydrogen goes in. This has got to be a 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals because that is your, they are your standard conditions. We must also have one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions in solution there. Okay, so that's very important. And we must also have one mole per dm cubed of copper ions, which are obviously in the beaker there on the right. So these are key things that you need to know. You need to know the general setup. So your, your standard hydrogen electrode has a platinum electrode um, and it has a little glass tube around it and it's got hydrogen going in at 298, 100 kilopascals and we've got uh, one mole per dm cubed of our hydrogen ions um, in that solution there as well as one mole per dm cubed in our copper. So these are the standards. So we must stick to these standards um, and you must be able to remember them. So they'll be expecting you to be able to recall the um, standard conditions for a standard hydrogen electrode. So that's temperature at 298, pressure at 100 kilopascals, and concentration of ions at one mole per dm cubed. So the diagram on the left, this obviously shows a standard hydrogen electrode connected to a copper, copper two plus half cell. Now assuming the conditions above are met, then the voltmeter should actually tell us the standard hydrogen electrode for copper and uh, for the copper, copper 2 plus um, half cell. So what we've got to do, though, we've got to be careful with this, okay? And there's another potential banana skin with the exam. So we've got, um, remember we said we need one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions in that beaker. So remember we needed um, this here. So we need one mole per dm cubed. It's of H plus ions, not of acid. So don't get this confused. And the reason why we shouldn't get this confused is because um, it's the... Um, they might say, right, we're going to use this acid, such as hydrochloric, and that will be fine. So hydrochloric acid, one mole per dm cubed of hydrochloric acid, produces one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions. But if the examiners are talking about sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid, so it produces two molecules or two H plus ions per molecule of H2SO4. So actually, we only need half mole per dm cubed 
of sulfuric acid because that will itself produce one mole of H plus ions. So I must stress that the concentration is the concentration of H plus ions, not the concentration of acid. Okay, if it's a a monoprotic acid such as HCl, then that's fine. But you've got to be careful because they they will and they well they may ask you to um, they may use sulfuric acid just to see if you're paying attention. So just watch out for that. I've seen it before. So. Okay, so we're going to look at the electrochemical series. So remember, we've been using some of them E0 values just as some of the examples before. And I've mentioned the electrochemical series is a big, basically, it's a big table of series. Um, so um, it's basically, like I say, it's a lift, list of half cell reactions and their standard electrical potential. So these have all been calculated by measuring them against that standard hydrogen electrode under standard conditions. Okay, so um, I've we're going to put up an example here and so this is an example of some of the um, half cell reactions um, that we need to know there is a massive list of these um, it's not just these ones that you can see on there obviously I can't fit them all on the screen um, but in the exam they will give you the ones that um, that that you will you know that you'll need so don't worry about remembering obviously these these equations nor the numbers it's about using the numbers and um, to work this out so you can see um, the table um, is also written in descending order um, and you you may actually get it the other way around as well. So in this case, we're starting obviously positive at the top here. Um, it brings cursor in, so there you go. Positive at the top and negative at the bottom, as you can see there. Uh, notice that all, just like what I said before, they're all shown in the reduced form. This is the standard way in which they display them. So it's always something plus electrons, okay? It's always in the reduced form. But remember, depending on what you're bonding it with, one of them will be oxidized and we flip it the other way around. But obviously, we have to look at that later, okay? So one of the things they'll ask you in the exam as well is about oxidizing agents and reducing agents. Um, so remember, just a reminder, um, oxidation is loss of electrons, um, but an oxidizing agent gains electrons. Okay, So reduction is the loss of electrons, but a reducing agent gains electrons. Okay, So we're going to look at them using them definitions or using that knowledge there we're going to then apply that into the electrochemical series and try and identify which ones are the most powerful reducing agents and which ones are the most powerful oxidizing agents so let's have a look at the um, oxidizing agents first so as we go up this table in this case this is a table going in descending order remember if it was in a different way the other way around then it would be going down but this one's showing this particular example here so just be vigilant with that agents on the left hand side of the equation are more easily reduced okay so for example this is like chlorine for example so they have an increasing tendency to gain electrons a more powerful oxidizing agent so remember this positive value is telling us that this reaction is is very likely to go negative values tells us that is that just really isn't going to work so a positive value means it really is going to go so chlorine is going to be more than happy to accept these two electrons to form cl minus so because it's um it's a positive value this is telling us that it is a more powerful oxidizing agent so you can see here that the most powerful oxidizing agent is chlorine in this example and the um, weakest oxidizing agent is magnesium 2 plus because that's at the bottom of this table here but it's always on the left hand side okay so we'll always comment on the left hand side not the right hand side because that's to do with reducing agents which we're going to look at now so as we go down this table this particular table um, we uh, have a stronger reducing agent that's being produced so you can see uh, agents on the right hand side of the equation are more easily oxidized so it's these ones here on the right hand side um, and they have an increase in tendency to lose electrons. In other words, they are a more powerful reducing agent. So your most powerful reducing agent here is going to be magnesium, which is the one on the right here. This is the most powerful uh, reducing agent. The weakest reducing agent is going to be Cl-. It's mainly the most powerful ones that they're going to ask you about. So make sure um, it's the most negative and the one on the right of the equation is going to be the most powerful reducing agent the most powerful oxidizing agent is going to be the most positive and the one on the left the species on the left hand side of the arrow okay so make sure you understand that there's a lot of information there um but you know as long as you can visualize that graph or that chart with the arrows then you should be fine 
Okay, so what we're going to do, obviously we've got the electrode potentials, we know what they do, we know what reduction and oxidation means, and we know we've got a whole list of these um, standard electrode potentials or all these E0 values. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the standard um, cell potential. Okay, so the standard cell potential E0 or the electrode potentials, these can be used to work out the standard cell potential, which is E0 cell. Okay, so the electrode potentials are for the half cells that we've seen. Obviously, um, when we connect them together and we form a cell, we can actually work out the E0 of um, that value as well. And we use a very simple um, formula here, probably one of the most, most simplest ones. E0 of the cell is E0 reduced minus E0 oxidized. So the way in which I remember the which way round it is, is um, I, I normally um, basically call it redox. So read and then ox. Okay, so it's reduction, reduction, oxidation, redox. Okay, so it's always reduction first minus oxidized. Okay, so um, remember your half cell equations with the most negative E0 value is being oxidized. Remember that, no problem. Negative, oxidized, positive, reduction, okay, or reduced. So if you have two positives or two negatives, then it is the most negative that is oxidized, okay, because that may happen. So that's the simple rules. Remember that, no problem. Negative, oxidized, uh, positive is reduced. So here's your first example. So we're going to use that electrochemical series that we'd seen before, and we're going to calculate the E0 of the cell when a Cl2, Cl- and a Zinc2 plus and Zinc half cells are connected together. So we're going to look at our data. So we need a Cl2 and a Cl-. minus. Here's our first one, so that's plus 1.36. And we've got a Zinc2 plus and Zinc half cell, which is going to be down here. So that's going to give us minus 0.76. So what we're going to do, the first thing is we need to identify which is being oxidized. Okay, so in this case, the one that's being oxidized is our zinc 2 plus zinc half cell. That is the most negative. So remember, negative, no problem, negative oxidized. So that's the one which is being oxidized. So what do we do with the oxidized one? Well, we put that on the right hand side of the equation. So we're going to put all the figures in and we get that. Okay, so we get plus 2.12 volts. So it's 1.36 minus minus 0.76. Okay, let's have a look at another example. So we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series again. And this time we're going to work out the E0 of the cell when the chlorine chloride electrode half cell um, actually reacts with a copper and copper 2 plus electrode. Okay, so when we connect these, so again we need to we need to work out what's being oxidized. So we've got our chlorine here, which is 1.36 plus 1.36, and our copper, which is plus 0.34. So these are both positive values. So it's the one which is the most negative is being oxidized, which in this case will be this one. So there it is. So the copper copper two plus one is the most negative, and this one's being oxidized. So we put that on the right hand side of the equation here and we subtract them away from each other, and we get plus 1.02 volts from this cell here, okay? Okay, so that's fine. So we know how to work out the unit of the cell. It's fairly straightforward. Just remember that acronym, no problem. Um, now, what we need to be able to do is be able to draw our cell. So instead of drawing two beakers with a salt bridge in between and the electrodes, etc., um, it's there's a better way of drawing it which is much quicker and much neater and we call this a cell notation okay and cell notations are basically used to simplify how we draw the setup of a cell okay it's a universal way of doing it um, and um, it allows us to draw it really really quickly and you'll see this as well but there's a few rules that we need to know so as a standard they are represented like this and the most negative half cell goes to the left hand side of the double line Okay, so you can see here that we've got our um, standard cell set up here. So effectively, the solid lines in a cell notation show a physical state change. So that might be, for example, a solid electrode in contact with eight quiz ions. There's a physical state change between the two. The double line shows us a salt bridge. So this is the bit in the middle. Um, and so let's look at a specific example of the zinc copper cell that we'd seen before. And so using that zinc and copper cell, we can set it up like this. And you can see that we have our um, zinc on the left. There it is. And we've got our copper on the right. So zinc was the most negative. So it sits to the left of that double line. Okay. 
Now, you can see we've got reduced and oxidized form. So what we're looking at is you have two elements to the half cell. You have the metal, which is zinc, and we have zinc 2 plus, which is the ion. This is more oxidized compared to that because that's got an oxidation state of zero because it's an element. This has got an oxidation state of plus two. So that's more oxidized. So that sits closest to that salt bridge and likewise on the other side as well. Okay. So there we are. So that was an oxidation state of plus two. Zinc has zero. So that one sits closest to the salt bridge. You've got to be careful though, because we have ions. Okay, so we have ions in solution. So all obviously all of these um, is looking at solid with the ions. Okay, but if you have two ions in solution, that's going to be difficult because we don't have a physical state change between them. For example, Fe2 plus Fe3 plus, we can't put a solid line. So luckily, we have a method of doing of tackling that as well and that method is actually using a comma so we use a comma not a solid line because they're in the same state so let's have a look at an example so you can see here we're going to use fe2 plus fe3 plus um, and we use um, a magnesium 2 plus and magnesium cell so you can see here that we've got uh, these obviously solid and aqueous so that's a physical state change so we put a solid line down there but between fe3 plus and fe2 plus there is the same state change here. So this is aqueous and aqueous. So there's no change there between these. So we put a comma between them because they're in the same state. Clearly there's a solid line here. We must have a solid electrode. And in this case, we're using a platinum electrode because it's platinum solid. Okay, so remember, um, that's what we need to use for these type of cells because we've got two aqueous ions and no solid um, electrode here. So we use platinum. Okay. Right. So... Now we know these cells and we know how to draw them out and we've seen the electrochemical series, we know what's oxidized and what's reduced and we know how to identify that and we know how to form these cells. We're going to put all this together and use it to predict if a reaction is going to go. Now this unfortunately will not predict the lot numbers because that would be brilliant if it did um, but it will, it does the next best thing which is to predict reactions. So we're going to predict the feasibility of reaction using these E0 or standard electrode potentials um, and um, it's basically going to tell us if a reaction is likely to proceed under standard conditions. So we'll bring back our electrochemical series again. So there it is in the bottom left. And we're going to look at this specific example here. So we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to predict whether magnesium will react with copper 2 plus ions in solution under standard conditions. So um, the first thing we've got to remember, remember the no problem, the no problem um, acronym that we used. So half cell with the most negative E0 values being oxidized. So the first thing we need to do here is identify what's being oxidized. So in this case, the Mg2 plus Mg half cell has the most negative E0 value, so is oxidized. Okay, so can you remember what we do with oxidized reactions? Well, what we do is we need to reverse it. We need to flip it around the other way. And then once we've flipped it around the other way, we write both equations that we need side by side. So you can see here that our magnesium equation has been flipped. So we've got Mg, Mg2 plus and two electrons. That's been oxidized. And this one remains the same because that's just been reduced. So write them side by side like that. And then what we need to do is combine these two equations. And the equation that we form here is actually the feasible reaction. So we can see here the one which is feasible is magnesium reacting with copper. So what we do is we compare that reaction that we've just developed there and compare it with the question. And we can see that actually, yes, magnesium will react with copper 2 plus ions because it tells us here. It says that magnesium will react with these copper 2 plus ions and this is a feasible reaction. So it's a match. So it does work. But... If you've seen any of my other videos, I like to make sure it's definitely correct. And it's a good technique to have in the exam because it gives you that bit of confidence if you if you do these little checks to make sure that it is correct. So one way of making sure this is right is you just chuck your numbers into that E0 cell reaction. Remember that equation, sorry? So remember that equation that we'd seen? That's the one on the top there. So we put the figures in, reduced, minus oxidized, and we get a positive value. And basically... If it's a positive E0 cell value, that means the reaction is feasible. Okay, any E0 cell that's positive, it means it's a feasible reaction under standard conditions. Okay. Uh, right, let's take a look at another example here. Um, so this one is um, looking at rust. So they might ask you to justify why something happens. So same principle, we're just confirming. So basically the question's told you, 
iron nails become rusty when in contact with air and moisture well that's obvious because you look around and you can see that iron rusts we can see it around us so we know it exists what the examiners are after is a justification so we need to prove that that is the case using the e naught um values there you know to justify that actually yeah this is definitely right we're giving some credibility to this to this uh, statement so the first thing is identify what we need to actually use so we're using um our water and oxygen equation here because it's air and moisture so we're using this half cell uh, and obviously fe2 plus to fe and we're using this half cell as well because this is iron going to iron 2 plus which is rust okay so iron oxide is, is the rust on, on the nail as you can see on there so the first thing we need to identify what has been oxidized so what's been oxidized here is the fe2 plus fe um, half equation is the most negative e naught out of the two so therefore that one is being oxidized so can you remember what we need to do now well we need to flip that equation around and write the two equations side by side so we reverse it and we write the equations there now this is where it's a little bit different because you'll notice that we have two electrons on the top equation and we have four electrons on the bottom now we can't combine these until the number of electrons is equal okay so uh, for all those who do maths this is just a simultaneous equation and um, so we want to try and get one of the factors here the same and cancel them out so what we're going to do is we've got 4e and 2e we're going to cross that one out and cross that one out well we're going to multiply this top row by 2 first there we are multiply that by 2 first get 2fe 2fe2 plus and 4 electrons and then we cancel out and combine so when we combine them equations we get something like this now this is our feasible reaction okay so this is the reaction that's feasible now what we need to do is use this equation that we've just come up with there and compare it with what we've been asked for in the question and it's asked us for to justify this and so basically the statement that we can say on this is that iron does indeed react with oxygen and water and it will form iron 2 plus which is your iron oxide that will react obviously to form iron oxide which is your rust and um, an alkaline solution as well so it's um, OH minus and of course we can um, prove this using our uh, E naught cell equation so if we put the numbers in E naught reduced minus E naught oxidized put all your numbers in and if we get a positive value which in this case we do it's not a massive positive value but it's still positive so under standard conditions this reaction will go because we're getting a positive e naught cell value okay right so once we've got all this information we can now use these cells that we've been looking at and scale it up a little bit bigger and look at something called batteries which of course you know what a battery is so um, batteries are just electrochemical cells and um, that are joined up and batteries come in two main forms and these are rechargeable and non rechargeable batteries okay so non-rechargeable batteries tend to be cheaper than your rechargeables. So, um, but your rechargeables um, are reversible and they can last longer, so cheaper in the long run. So a classic example of a rechargeable battery is your mobile phone. That's exactly the same. So your phone, when you plug in your phone, um, it recharges the battery up. Um, and if you, um, uh, if you have a non-rechargeable uh, non battery, that's just like a standard, like, like a... Um, a standard battery that you would purchase you know from the shop like an AA battery for example and um, use it once and then you dispose of it so lithium ion batteries like I say are a good example of your rechargeables and um, they're commonly used in wireless uh, power tools tablets mobile phones electric cars so you can see a lot of um, different uh, uses for these batteries now the uh, lithium ion batteries um, for example the, the use in mobile phones they have the following components so they have electrode a which is lithium cobalt oxide so that's what's in a lithium ion battery and electrode b is graphite so we use graphite which is just carbon um, and the electrolyte which is the bit in between we'll look at the electrolyte when we look at fuel cells but the electrolyte is the solution that contains that's within the battery that straddles between these two electrodes is a lithium salt dissolved in an organic solvent okay so remember this is the electrolyte is the part of the battery that acts as the conductive pathway for the ions to move from one electrode to the other so um it's a bit like a sea of ions effectively okay now um to identify 
which is the negative electrode, um, we need to establish which is producing the electrons, i.e. oxidation. Okay. So what the example will expect you to do is to use this information here to um, answer questions on it using the same principles that we used before, which is no problem. Negative oxidation, um, positive reduction. Okay. So to establish the overall reaction in a lithium ion battery, we need to know the half equations at each electrode. So you can see here, here's our half equations, and obviously these would be these would be given to you. So we've got a positive E0 value and a negative E0 value for each of the different reactions that's happening at each of the electrodes. So lithium, the Li plus Li, has the most negative E0 value. So oxidation occurs here. So remember, we flip the most negative equation around, and this shows the electrons are actually being produced. So this is your negative electrode. Okay, electrons being produced is the negative electrode. So the negative electrode, we have this reaction. So we've just flipped that half equation around, this one here, because that was the most negative. And obviously the positive electrode, we keep that reaction, uh, keep that half equation the same. We look at our electrons. There's one electron in each, so that's fine. So we balance them, cancel out the electrons and write the overall equation. But this is the overall equation for the discharge. So this is um, using the battery. So for example, um, using your mobile phone without it plugged in. So the reaction that occurs when you're using that phone is lithium reacting with your cobalt dioxide or your cobalt oxide, which is here. Um, and this will form your lithium salt, okay, which is this, this product here. So we can work out the E0 of the cell for this um, by using the equation that we've seen before. So we do um, reduced minus oxidized, put the numbers in, and we get the E0 of the cell of plus 3.6 volts. So that's quite a significant um, uh, potential difference there. So that's why these batteries or these, this setup is really useful because you need a lot of power to power um, you know, phones and laptops and tablets, etc. Okay, so rechargeable batteries um, work by simply plugging them in to supply a current. So that's a flow of electrons. And so these, uh, this current forces electrons to flow in the opposite way. Um, and as we do, what we do is we reverse this reaction. So if it asks you to write an equation for um, the recharging of the battery, all we do is we flip that equation the other way around because we're just forcing um, uh, the lithium, lithium salt to reproduce your lithium and cobalt oxide, obviously with the help of electrons um, to do that. Okay, so that's really what you need to know about batteries. Now, the the kind of um, final part is to do with fuel cells. So fuel cells are, um, unlike batteries, they need a continuous supply of fuel. Okay, um, rather than um, batteries which have a ready store of the chemicals. So you don't need to keep supplying um, um, fuel to a battery. It already has the energy or the chemicals required to do that. But a fuel cell needs a continuous supply. So... Um, if you look here, we're going to look at a specific example for this one. This is an alkaline hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. There's an example of it. You can get acid ones as well, but for this example, we're going to look at an alkaline one. So you can see we've got a picture of the fuel cell on the left. And basically what we're going to do for the next few slides is just look at what these numbers mean, what's actually happening at these, because you are expected to know that. Um, and then once we've done that, we then need to um, we then need to summarize it and look at the reactions overall. So that's what we're going to do first. So we'll look at number one. And so at point number one, we've got a hydrogen feed here. So the hydrogen feed, as you can see, um, um, uh, reacts with the OH minus ions that actually come from this side of the uh, reaction, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and basically the hydrogen reacts with the hydroxide ions to form water and four electrons. Okay. So then the flow of electrons, this is um, point two, the electrons produced in that part travel through the platinum electrode and through the wire. So remember platinum is good because it's inert. Um, it's a good conductor of electricity. So the electrons flow through here and this flows through to the third section, which is the component. So this is could be, for example, a car um, to power a car. It could be um, to power, um, power in a house if you had a um, quite a few of these fuel cells so anything like that this is where the use comes out of it okay so now we're moving on to step four which is this bit and this is basically where oxygen is fed in here so this reacts and um, with water and the four electrons that have been produced from this side um, to make the OH minus signs that were needed to react over here 
So the overall reaction is oxygen coming in, reacting with two lots of water and four electrons, and that forms four lots of OH minus ions um, that are produced here. And obviously them, them OH minus ions are then used to react with the hydrogen that's coming in on this side. So the fifth one is the negative electrode. So this here is the negative electrode. This is the cathode. Um, and so electrons flow to the negative electrode. So they come from here to the negative electrode. Um, and this is also made from platinum. Now, number six, this is the electrolyte. So this is the green section here on this diagram. So this is made from potassium hydroxide solution, which is this bit here. It carries the OH minus ions here from the cathode, from this bit, to the anode, to this side. Uh, at seven, this is your positive electrode. This is your anode this bit here and so electrons flow from this um, and it moves across to the um, uh, to the cathode which is this side and then at eight water is eliminated here um, and so obviously this is the product of step one some of the water then emits out here so the only emission with this type of fuel is water now this is very different to say a fossil fuel uh, where you produce carbon dioxide and water and maybe it's carbon particulates carbon monoxide nitrates and sulfates and all sorts this fuel is much much cleaner the only product here is water that's produced that's the only um, uh, byproduct the uh, last step the ninth step is the movement of the oh minus ions so the oh minus ions that were produced here at step four are actually carried through the electrolyte here and um, towards the um uh, towards the anode um at this point so that's all that nine symbolizes so you can see that we also have some ion exchange membranes as well and the ion exchange membranes actually sit on the electrodes um, and they sit on the side where the electrolyte is and these membranes allow the oh minus ions to pass through um, but not the hydrogen and oxygen gas because the last thing we want to do is to allow hydrogen and oxygen gas to pass through and meet because the electrons will be transferred here and we won't actually get the benefit through the wire so that's why we must keep them separate so to summarize the first step is the hydrogen feed so the hydrogen is actually fed in through here reacts with the oh minus ions from the solution um, from uh, step four which is here uh, they come from the solution to step nine so the overall reaction is 2h2 4 oh minus producing 4 h2o and four electrons and obviously the oxygen then is fed on this side so this reacts with the four electrons that come from um, the hydrogen feed um, and this produces the 4 h oh minus ions which are then fed through to feed on this side so it's one big circle as you can see now we can combine these two equations and cancel out any species which are the same um, such as your waters and electrons etc um, and we form this overall reaction which is showing what's happening so effectively it's two lots of hydrogen reacting um, with your oxygen which is here um, and this will form obviously two molecules of, of water um, which is produced um, as a as a byproduct Okay, so let's look at the pros and cons of using these. It sounds like a really good idea using these, doesn't it? Because there's no harmful emissions. It's just water. Looks as though we're producing, we're using oxygen as well, you know, which we can get, in, you know, quite readily. So let's look at the the pros and cons of using these fuel cells to generate electricity. So the advantages. Um, is that fuel cells are much more efficient than an internal combustion engine and some cars are now actually hydrogen powered i believe um i think um california i think use hydrogen power don't we use much of it in the uk we've mainly gone down the line of electric cars um, rather than hydrogen powered um more energy is converted into kinetic energy um, and so therefore combustion engines waste a lot of energy as thermal energy so these um hydrogen uh, so these fuel cells are much more efficient <coughs> excuse me right so many electrical like say many electrical vehicles are battery powered however um, unlike batteries and um, fuel cells don't need to be recharged you can literally just fill up you have a um, a tank of hydrogen in your boot uh, and you fill up with um, hydrogen uh, and you just need a ready supply of that hydrogen and obviously oxygen which can come from the air as well um, and also the only waste product is water as i've said um, no carbon dioxide is emitted so unlike what you get in a traditional um, combustion engine. So these are a lot better for the environment. 
So the disadvantages, um, so the disadvantages are that hydrogen is actually really highly flammable. Um, it must be stored and transported correctly. Um, it's not the type of gas that you want um, near a naked flame. So um, we've got to handle it really carefully and, and as a result, it's expensive to store it. So there we are. So it's expensive to store and transport it. Effectively, you're transporting round um, a very light gas. So that has to be, to make it cost efficient, it's normally pressurized. Um, it's a really high pressure so you can transport more of it around um, you know per, per lorry so um, so yeah so storage um, has got to be in pressurized containers um, and also energy is required to make the hydrogen and the oxygen in the first place and quite often unfortunately fossil fuels are used to um, uh, used to pass water through an electrolysis process um, and this obviously uses fossil fuels. So there's an indirect pollutant here um, because the actual manufacture of the hydrogen in the first place can use fossil fuels. But of course, if the making of the um, of the hydrogen um, is used by green sources, then of course it's quite a, a green way to go. But as it stands, you know we're still using a lot of um, you know fossil fuels in terms of electrolysis process. Okay, and that's it. So that's the end of the video on electrode potentials and electrochemical cells. So you can see there's quite a bit of information in there, but the standard acronym, like I say, anything, if you're going to forget anything, don't forget this, which is, um, you know, no problem. Negative, oxidized, uh, positive, reduced. Okay, so just remember that. Um, like I say, there's a full series of AQA videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Uh, they're all for free, as well as whiteboard tutorials and exam workthroughs. Um, Cost of all three, all I ask is you just hit the subscribe button um, and that would be absolutely fantastic. I'd really appreciate that. Um, and also, um, you can purchase these, like I said, right at the start of the video. Just click on the link below um, and you'll be able to get a hold of that. Great value for money. Um, but that's it. Bye-bye.